All right, Sagar, what's on your radar? Well, the entire political world was transfixed yesterday when the DNC slate of speakers was released, including us. We were trying to read the tea leaves of what the speaker's list meant for the veep stakes. Turns out it's Kamala. And as important as that is, and as much as we're going to be talking about that today, it's also worth looking at which non-vice presidential hopefuls were on that speaking list. What those names tell us about the modern Democratic Party and the never Trump shell that it is becoming. So alongside names like Pete Buttigieg or Gavin Newsom that you might expect for a DNC coronation of Joe Biden, there was a name that we knew would be there but is still galling to see in its finality. That's former Ohio Governor John Kasich. Kasich famously ran for president against Trump in 2016, garnering negligible percentages of the vote in the Republican primary, finding out the hard way that his mailman shtick coupled, coupled with repulsive eating habits and old school reignite, Reaganite ideas was no longer wanted in the Republican Party. Kasich's speech at the Democratic National Convention is the final apotheosis of never-Trump Republicanism. They don't care about Republican voters. They don't care about defending any of the social values that Republican voters task them with defending. The only thing they will truly go to the mat for is the right to invade a foreign country and keep corporate taxes low. And that's not me saying that. Listen to John Kasich on CNN when he was pressed about why exactly he's speaking at the convention. I think I have a right to define what it means to be a conservative, and that means uh, a government when necessary, uh, not a opposed to it, that what the conservative movement ought to be is opportunity for everyone. The Republican Party ought to be a party that has a positive message of lifting everyone. But you know, Aaron, look, leaders walk a lonely road. And if you're not prepared to walk a lonely road and do the things that your conscience tells you to do, then how do you think about yourself when you look in the mirror? I mean, I'm comfortable with the decisions I make. Of course there's blowback. You know, Republicans are critical. Some are, are praising me. Democrats are debating themselves. Should he be able to do this? But this is not an unusual place for me to be. I've been a reformer almost all of my life. I've been very independent. And I'm a Republican, but the Republican Party has always been my vehicle but never my master. You have to do what you think is right in your heart, and I'm comfortable here. So that clip is very revealing. First, for the nauseating idea that Kasich is somehow better than us all, but more the platitudes that he defines as real conservatism. And the only concrete thing that he really mentions there is smaller government. Now, I'm not opposed to smaller government in some cases, but you and I have all been around long enough to know exactly what he means. Conservatism in the eyes of John Kasich is being polite while you cut corporate taxes in the morning, invade Afghanistan at lunch, and declare war on Russia at dinner time. Kasich's ascension to the DNC stage, it comes at the exact same time former George W. Bush spokesperson Nicole Wallace gets elevated to the center spotlight of MSNBC programming. It comes at the same time that Anna Navarro, one of the most insufferable people on the planet and a so-called never Trump Republican, has been tapped by the Biden campaign to head up their Latino outreach. It comes at the time that never Trump Republicans like Rick Wilson, George Conway, and former John Kasich staffer John Weaver head the hottest pro-Biden super PAC, the grifting Lincoln Project. Now, it's pretty fair to say that the mainstream Democratic Party's goal of bringing new people into their coalition extends only to the Republicans who hate Trump because of his departure from neocon foreign policy and even having the appearance of departing from GOP economic ideology. Are those really the people you want to bring into your fold after historic 2016 election that soundly rejected exactly such neoliberalism? But as such, as I love, as much as I love bashing the Democratic Party for embracing these people, it's they themselves who deserve the most scorn, ridicule, and disgust. Navarro, Rick Wilson, Stuart Stevens, John Weaver, John Kasich, many of these never Trumpers purported for years to represent the GOP. They conned their voters into thinking that they would really stand up for their interests. But ultimately, all they really cared about was enriching themselves and selling out their very own voters. This was perfectly on display. Ross Douthat of the New York Times, he nailed this dynamic in his latest column about so-called GOP operative Stuart Stevens, who just wrote a book called, quote, It Was All a Lie, How the Republican Party Became Donald Trump. Stevens was the chief political strategist for Mitt Romney in 2012. So he's not exactly a nobody. 
Doubt that reveals that Stewart's book depicts Republican voters as vile racists, sexists, homophobes, and more. It's basically white suburbanite fan fiction about gross hillbillies and lower class people, which tells you a lot about Stuart Stevens. Stuart Stevens and John Kasich and Rick Wilson and so many of these other never Trumpers despised the very voters that they purported to try and represent from the very beginning. They take no culpability for their role in getting the country to a place where it looks at Donald Trump and gives him a chance at the presidency. Why would so many millions be willing to do so in the first place? Because it seemed like their last chance, last chance at saving their job from getting shipped overseas, their last chance from having Washington remember that you exist, that you matter in this economy and aren't just an automaton that is meant to serve your betters on Wall Street and Silicon Valley. Not all that has worked out under Trump, I'm the first to admit and criticize him for it. But any honest assessment by Stuart Stevens of his career would say that the Republican Party got Trump because people like him worked for a candidate who insulted 47% of Americans and who picked a running mate whose sole mission in life was to lower the corporate tax rate and gut entitlement spending. Yet, the worst part is, these people look like they're winning. Not only have they now taken over the Democratic Party, but if Biden wins, many of those who quietly agreed with them but refused to be as bombastic for the money will be restored to their positions in the Republican elite. They will fight tooth and nail if Trump is gone to make sure that the Republican Party can once again proudly be a party where John Kasich feels welcome back too. I'll sit here and say the opposite. My hope for America is that the Republican and the Democratic parties both become places where such people are never welcome again. Here, here. And (laughs) it's it's kind of amazing, right? I mean, you see, John Kasich is going to get up there. First of all, when he defines conservatism, all he wants to focus on is that smaller government piece and nothing else. You actually, you know, laid out about much of the union busting, and even he pretend used to at least pretend to be socially conservative. I don't know what he cares about now, but. What are they really going to the mat for? What are Rick Wilson and John Kasich and so many of the others going to the mat for? Norms for invading things and cutting taxes. That's it. Yeah. That's actually all they really care about. Mm-hmm. And it's really disgusting, especially for somebody like Stuart Stevens, former chief political strategist for Mitt Romney, to say that all of the people who voted for Mitt Romney were actually vile, racist homophobes or terrible people, and that the fact that they won or the fact the party has become what it is has nothing to do with their own sellout for years and years and years. That's always the part that they forget to mention. No, and there is one other principle they really care about, which you forgot to mention, which Mm. is their own, like, financial success. Of course, yeah. You know, centrality to to the conversation. And you said, right, that they're basically winning right now. I mean, Kasich at the DNC is a perfect example. And they are. Why? Because they're the ones who are actually willing to withhold their vote, willing to flip sides, willing to be wherever it's convenient for them to be. There is no group that is more influential in the Democratic Party right now than the frickin' Never Trumper. I know. I mean, you laid it out. MSNBC is like all in on it. And Anna Navarro at the center of the the Biden campaign. Navarro is a right-wing reactionary. (laughs) And this is your approach to Latino voters, a group with whom you are doing incredibly poorly vis-a-vis Hillary Clinton with lots of ground that you should be making up against this president. So it it really does tell you everything. And um, uh, this was not my original thought. This was Ellie Mistal over at The Nation, their justice correspondent, pointed out the dichotomy of they choose from Ohio, John Kasich, instead of Sherrod Brown. Yes. That choice tells you everything. Of course. Sherrod's a populist. He's yes. the, the labor union guy. He's there with the, the union workers in Ohio, gets reelected time and time again in a state that has been trending red now right. for years. But that guy doesn't get a slot, and instead it's John Kasich. That's a great point. Union buster, deficit hawk, like aggressively conservative ideological zombie reaganism. Like, that is John Kasich, and that's the Ohio that you want to elevate. But it all makes sense because ultimately in the Democratic Party, if you want to hold on to that neoliberal project and your ascendancy and your power, you actually don't want to keep those parts of the working class. You actually don't want to keep the young voters in the tent because if they start voting in larger and larger numbers, they're going to kick your butts out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I saw another great point, and we'll talk about this later in the show. But Andrew Yang. Andrew Yang doesn't get a speaking slot. John Kasich 
gets a sneaking slot. Who's got more energy behind him in America, the Andrew Yang or John Kasich? Nobody voted for John Kasich. Am I the only guy who forgets this? Well, and not only that, but okay, if you're if yeah. your approach here, and this is the argument I saw online, yeah. why are you so mad about John Kasich? We should be all in on yeah. whoever wants to join forces to no. beat Trump. No. But just think about this, just from a strategic perspective. Who actually, of all the Democrats who ran, who actually appealed and flipped Trump voters yes, in their primary? That's right, Andrew. It was Yen. Andrew. Forty-two percent of his voters were Trump voters. Andrew, yeah. Tulsi, and Bernie were the three that did the best among Trump voters, and by a lot of metrics, Andrew did the best mm -hmm. disproportionately among Trump voters. So, if you actually cared about appealing to independent-minded people who voted for Trump but aren't satisfied with the direction that he's taking the administration. Yang is a much better choice than John Kasich, who literally appeals to no one. That's like I said, they don't care about appealing. I don't think they actually care about appealing to Trump voters. I don't think they care about appealing to any voters except for these disaffected upper middle class white suburbanites and many of these other neocons so that they can have this cable. It's like the idea of cable news bipartisanship. We're like, we don't, we disagree on this and disagree on that, but we always agree on invading Russia. Right. And like, and they're, they're like, and that's America today. And you're like, no, that's not, that's not what we want. <laughs> so like I said, make you know, make John Kasich a person who has a home in neither party right. and we'll have a better America. Make, make that the new bipartisan yeah, consensus. That's right. <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to your radar next, Crystal.